Welcome to Silver Oaks quarterly webinar. My name is Shannon King, and I'm here with Jonathan Charlo as usual. So welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Our webinar is scheduled to last approximately 45 to 60 minutes. And as usual, a copy of it will be posted to the Silver Oak website. Um, typically, it takes a, a couple of days or a week to get that posted. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, I encourage you to reach out to your Silver Oak advisor after the session. If uh, you're not currently working with a Silver Oak advisor, feel free to contact me directly at 952-896-5701. And uh, I wanna thank Jonathan and John and the rest of the Silver Oak team for making today's webinar possible. I know we try and truncate it into a 45 to 60 minute session with as few slides as possible, but that is a real challenge, especially in times like we're going through now. Um, but thanks for, uh, for putting everything together, Jonathan and the rest of the team. For compliance purposes, I must note that we will be discussing the overall markets and the economy during today's session. And in doing so, we'll be providing our interpretations and perspectives. You should not rely upon this information as fact when making any investment decisions. Also, we will not be discussing specific Silver Oak portfolio performance as each of our clients' portfolios are customized. However, for clients on today's session, you should have received your customized performance report within the last couple of weeks. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to your Silver Oak advisor if they've not already contacted you. And as the Chief Compliance Officer, my last disclosure is that past performance is no guarantee of future success. So let's take a look at the agenda for today. We'll start with a discussion around the economy. Then we'll transition into a discussion around the markets. We'll talk about both market conditions over the last quarter or even the last year or so, but then we'll also talk about Silver Oak's outlook moving forward, both from an economic perspective and from a markets perspective. We'll provide some updates and other items at the end. Closing out today's session with an insurance series. Uh, we're gonna start an insurance series in each of these webinars going forward for the next um, year or so. Parsing out particular components of insurance, uh, today we're gonna talk about travel insurance. Um, although we may not talk about these, uh, Jonathan, every single webinar uh, over the next year or so, we will talk about various uh, types of insurance like travel insurance today, personal and property insurance, things of that nature. Very, very short little tidbits of information on that. But for today, we're gonna start with the economy. And we have here, the economy is slowing down. So Jonathan, where do we see this slowdown occurring? Well, looking at our market dashboard, um, where we have a composite score and we look at four different areas, um, one of the areas that we did, did definitely see a slowdown is in the economy. We were actually projecting that to be neutral this quarter, but it did turn negative. And we're going to see this later on in the webinar, but the leading economic indicators all weakened uh, in the third quarter. More than we thought they would even. Absolutely. Um, hence why we didn't go to neutral, but actually went to negative uh, on the ec economy. The credit markets um, actually are still positive. Now, they are weakening a bit, and we're gonna talk a little bit about yield curves and things like that today. Um, we are projecting uh, this to uh, be neutral next quarter. Valuations remain uh, high. Now, we're gonna show later in the webinar that they've come down and are a bit more reasonable. So we are projecting next quarter that to go to neutral, but the wild card will be earnings, and if earnings decline from here, um, that will be kind of a counterweight of uh, weight to that, so we'll have to watch that. And then market sentiment still remains very, very negative. 
Um, we're going to be talking about some of that uh, later on. Uh, we are projecting that to remain negative uh, in the next quarter. So putting that all together, uh, the composite did go from neutral to negative in the quarter, um, and we'll show that actually on the next slide. Yeah, so on this slide, we'll see that six-month composite dropping down. Uh, the current composite, if we look at, at the current, it's right now at 2.23, which is below kind of what we consider to be a threshold of 3.15. And the six-month composite is now down to 2.55, which is below what we consider the threshold of 3.25. And that threshold really delineates kind of more positive versus more negative uh, conditions. Now, that's looking at kind of a composite of information via the market dashboard. If we drill down into components, let's just talk about GDP. What is GDP doing? Well, GDP has stalled. Now, technically in the last two quarters, it has come down a little bit. But on a more positive note, we, we have completely recovered from the pandemic and kind of returned to that trend line. Now, for the third quarter, the Atlanta Fed is estimating GDP now will be kind of in the high twos. Uh, however, the fourth quarter and the first quarter of next year, um, the expectations right now are those could be slightly negative. So... I guess with GDP stalling, what's happening with companies, both you know profits and you made reference to earnings? Well, profit margins are declining. Now, admittedly, they're coming down from very, very high levels, but companies are being impacted by higher input prices. And there is, you know, they're approaching that limit to price increases that, that customers will pay. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, we've actually seen those margins come down. And earnings? Yeah, well, with the margin outlook uh, tightening, we are seeing earnings estimates come down. If we look at the top part of the slide, that black line is kind of the earnings growth line. And so that has topped out, has been coming down. Currently for the year, the expectation is it will be up about 5%. Now, earlier in the year, it was as high as 8 to 10%. So we're definitely seeing uh, earnings growth kind of being ratcheted down. And, and that's kind of normal. I think analysts get in the beginning of the year a little bit optimistic for the year. Um, and earnings so far this earnings season have been relatively good. Um, now we're, you know, right kind of at the beginning of the season. So we still got a lot to, to go through. Absolutely. And, and as importantly, if maybe more importantly, is really management's um, viewpoints on where margins are headed, prices are headed, and whether or not they will start lowering guidance again. Sure. Let's talk about housing uh, because that is, is a big one. And as a matter of fact, in today's Wall Street Journal, uh, they had reported that, uh, of course, it was dated released in the last day or two, that existing home sales fell for an eighth straight month, um, the longest streak in 15 years. Sales of previously owned homes declined 1.5% um, outside of COVID. That's one of the lowest since 2012. Um, so we're definitely seeing weakening here. And, and what you're showing on this slide is, is even affordability is now not looking so good. Right, with an increase in mortgage rates now to roughly 7%, with the price increases we saw during the pandemic, now they are starting to come down. But when you put that uh, together, we're looking at the affordability um, at levels last seen in, in 2007, and then prior to that in the late 80s. Hmm. So this is just a bunch of bad news so far. Surely there's something that is a little brighter. Yeah, we've, we've definitely seen the labor markets kind of defy expectations and have been persistently strong uh, throughout the year, and in, including in the last month or so. Um, so we've seen unemployment uh, come down a, a bit more. We've seen um, 
job openings stay re relatively high. Now that's come down a little bit as well. Um, we've seen wage growth come down a little bit. So this is one uh, bright spot that, that we have seen in the economy this year. So, I mean, when you mention wage growth, it's good that people's wages go up. It's just we're concerned of the wage price spiral. Correct. And, and how that affects inflation. Exactly. Another bright spot has been consumers. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've shown this in the past, so I wanted to give an update. But um, if we look kind of in the middle of the screen, what we're seeing is the buildup in excess savings uh, that occurred during the pandemic as, as people spent less, were, were in homes, we had stimulus payments. Now, we've seen that start to draw down, and that's really what we're looking at um, on the uh, right side of, of the screen. So we've uh, actually drawn down a little under a trillion dollars in, in that savings. Uh, we still have about a trillion dollars in, in savings. And so that provides a, a good backstop for consumers. Uh, again, if the labor markets aren't as weak um, as we've seen in past mm -hmm. down years, that really puts uh, consumers in, in a good shape to either con, uh, continue to uh, spend or in a recovery provide the firepower uh, to start spending it. Sure. So as we look in total at our economic factors, you'll see that we have to the far right, negative signs, uh, our US dollar indicator, the interest rates and housing were all moved from the neutral column to the negative column. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about pretty much all of these, or we've touched on some of them already, but the US dollar, that has just been at historic highs against just about every currency across the, the, the uh, uh, globe. Yeah, 20 year highs for the dollar. Now that has impacted international returns um, and it likely will impact US manufacturers as it um, makes it more ex expensive for them to export yes. uh, their goods and services. And on the far right, you'll see the two arrows pointing down. We decided to keep corporate earnings and credit conditions in the positive uh, column, but the down arrows are indicating that sentiment is definitely shifting in those uh, areas. While if we look in the neutral column, unemployment you just touched on, that's remained positive and, and sentiment is up, but global growth, the Eurozone and monetary policy Although we did not shift columns, again, their sentiment is, is transitioning more toward the negative side. So the real big question here that I know I get asked a lot, and I suspect you do as well, is are we currently in a recession? Because all the data generally, I mean, we have a couple of bright spots, but generally it doesn't look all that bright. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a question um, that is currently being debated. And there are reasons, you know, that both sides believe they're right. So uh, on the one side, for those who believe we are in a recession, they'll point to the two quarters in a row of negative GDP growth. The only thing, though, is that has been viewed as the recession indicator. Now, technically, the National Bureau of Economic Research is the government agency that makes these calls, and they've done it really since the late 70s. Now, they don't actually look at just the GDP issue. They actually have about six indicators that they look at. And so that's what we're showing on the bottom part of the slide. And so what you can see is, is certainly one area is negative, a couple are kind of flattish, and, and a couple are up a little bit. Those are
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it looks like a line that's going up straight. Um, so uh, that, that's that been rising all year, but, but especially in recent months. So to close out the economic section of today's discussion um, and wrap things up on that, you know, you started this section or we started that section with the economy is slowing down. And I would say that's, that's a, you know, if you want to use two words, uh, slowing down, that's probably the best two words to describe the economy as, as we speak today. But let's talk about how that's impacting the markets. And, you know, I, I first read this slide, Jonathan, and you put widespread weakness. And I thought, well, that's maybe sugarcoating things a, a little bit much. But then I went to this next slide, and I think you've given a much better description of the markets uh, with the title being terrible start to the year. Yeah, absolutely. If we look on the left side, we're, we're looking at the bond market. And uh, with bonds being down almost 15% this year, this is literally the worst start to the year for bonds going all the way back to, to 1926. So, And it's not even like close. No. The second worst year is down 3.9. I mean, that is a huge differential between worst and second worst. Yeah, driven by the Federal Reserve increasing uh, the Fed funds rate to combat inflation. And, and we don't show it in any of our slides, but the fastest increase with the highest level, I think, in the Fed's history. Um, now, it hasn't gone up on an absolute basis as high as like in the 80s, but the magnitude from zero to where we are in such a short time is, is a record. Um, now, unfortunately, it's happening at a time when, you know, stocks aren't doing that well either. Right, absolutely. And so from that pers uh, uh, basis, they're down about 24%, um, which would be the fourth um, worst start uh, for the year. But it actually is, it, it is interesting that all three quarters of this year, we've seen uh, negative returns for stocks and bonds. The last time that happened was 1931. Wow. So very historic. So when we look at the performance for the various equity markets shown here, uh, not going to be a surprise based on our uh, discussion that everything was negative um, across all of the equity categories, whether you're U.S., international, large cap, small cap, uh, didn't really much matter. Year to date, obviously, that trend has continued. Um, now, that is, though, coming off of three really, really good years. So, you know, don't get me wrong. It is a bummer to be down. And to be down at these levels, especially across both bonds and stocks, it's not pleasant. I recognize that, but it is coming off of three years of pretty exceptional performance. And of course, on this slide, we'll see the fixed income, commodity, and, and REIT performance. And for the quarter across the board, negative performance uh, with really only commodities on a year to date basis being positive. So let's talk about value versus growth. Um, and I know if folks uh, listen to some prior webinars going back over the last five, six, seven, maybe even eight years, there was a pretty constant theme of growth outperforming value. Yes, and that is really what we've seen on a year-to-date basis. But interestingly, in the third quarter, uh, large cap growth actually was down a little bit less than, than value. And we did see that in mid cap and, and small cap. Um, but in general for the year, value has far outperformed uh, growth. And the other thing to point out here, which I found a little bit interesting, um, there's not a big deviation, but if you look to the far right in small cap, small cap generally was down less than mid cap and large cap in both growth and value. Actually, value, uh, excuse me, growth was slightly positive for the quarter. Um, and I think that might have to do with the fact that the dollar's been so strong that you know small cap companies really have most of their revenue domestic. 
They don't do a lot of international. And so they're not impacted by that real strong dollar. That's not a drag. Now on the flip side, if we are going into a recession, small cap companies tend to get hit a little harder in recessions because they don't have the, the resources that the big companies have with the free cash flow, et cetera, et cetera. At least they tend not to. Some do, but but tend not to. So that's just something to, to keep an eye on. We might get a little bit of tailwind in small cap from not having the uh, international exposure and the currency issue, but there may be a headwind with the recessionary pressures. And here, I just mentioned the strong dollar. Um, we can see how that's impacted international performance. Yeah, absolutely. There was a time in the summer where international really wasn't doing that badly. It was actually down a little less than U.S. markets. But, but clearly over the summer into the fall, we did see the dollar surge, which has hit more recent performance. Really the bright spot um, you can see in the middle is Latin America. Um, where we have positive returns. Now, Latin America is heavily commodity oriented. And so with commodity prices down in the last quarter, but still up for the year, they're getting that benefit. And let's talk about bonds. So we went through the US markets and the international markets on the equity side. Um, it's it's you know, very evident that bonds are being impacted to the negative. Yeah, absolutely. Across all bonds, double digit uh, decreases. If you look on the left, emerging markets almost down 30%. The dollar impact, the whole European impact, as well as what's going on in China. Um, with the rapid rate increases, we're seeing you know the 10 year treasury yields up. So that performance is down. Um, really, you know, when you look at it, the interesting thing, I, I look at is the high yield in the corporate mm -hmm. market. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but investment grade corporate bonds are actually down less, or excuse me, down more than high yield. And you would actually kind of expect that to be the opposite. Yes. And it might, it might flip if we get into a recession because high yield might be pressured during a uh, recession. Absolutely. So not to beat up on bonds even more, uh, but I did find it interesting. This is the first time in history that core bonds have lost money over a five-year period. Yeah, again, historic. Wow. Well, and I guess, you know, we don't really have a slide comparing this, uh, but we could look back in, in one of the prior slides to, to kind of get a sense of this. I don't want to be too hard on bonds. I mean, bonds are down. They're down at historic levels, but they're still down half as much as stocks. So, you know, nobody, I don't think, expected bonds to be down as much as they are, but we do have to keep it, you know, in relative terms that, yes, it's a bummer to be down, but still half as much or maybe a third as much in some cases as stocks. If we look here, though, what we're showing with this slide are various portfolios. So if you look in the left column, it's various portfolios with different allocations. The one that I just circled, it's the performance for an all equity portfolio. On the far right, you'll see that that all equity portfolio was down 37% during the dot com bubble in early 2000s. It was also down 37% during the Great Recession in 2008. And so far year to date, that 100% equity portfolio measured in this case, just simply by the S&P 500 is down about 24%. Now that probably isn't all that surprising to anyone, but I think this might be. If you look at the 100% fixed income portfolio, one that's supposed to be very, very conservative. In the dot-com bubble, it's actually up double digit. In the Great Recession, it was up 5%. Year to date, it's down 14. And even a portfolio with 60% equities, 40% bonds, which again is pretty moderate 
maybe even moderately conservative considered portfolio. In the dot-com bubble, that was down 13%. During the Great Recession, it was down 20. And, and remember, we don't call the Great Recession the Great Recession for no reason at all. I mean, it was a painful period. But so far this year, a 60-40, pretty moderate, moderately conservative allocated portfolio is down equally as much as in the Great Recession. It's pretty astonishing. Yeah. Absolutely, and and when you think of uh, even more conservative port portfolios that have more fixed income, um, you see that returns are are down yeah. more this year. Yeah, and and that's not what people signed up for. No, no, it's quite quite unusual. Um, let's though talk about our outlook. So that's where we've been. That's where we've come from in the markets. So as we look forward. What are we expecting? Um, and we'll start with the economy. We do expect the Fed to s stay on their rate hiking course. I, I just don't anticipate they're going to deviate from that at this point, which is going to increase the probability of a recession. The two key components that we've touched on already, what's going to happen to consumers and their spending, and what will happen with corporate earnings? Those are really important uh, factors as we think about one, will we indeed go into a recession and frankly, how deep the recession will be and how long it will last. We do believe eventually the Fed is going to succeed in reducing inflation. Uh, the timing of that is really impossible to know, but it does look like with this aggressive stance, they will ultimately get inflation down. Internationally though, economies look really, really challenged. Um, Europe obviously is gonna have a, a pretty tough winter with, uh, with all of their energy issues. China might be a bright spot because they're pretty much, Jonathan, doing the opposite of what everybody else in the world's doing. Um, but there's, you know, there's just going to be a continued headwind, both fiscally and, and from a monetary uh, perspective. Let's touch, though, on the yield curve as we think about particularly the U.S. economy. Right. So in general, interest rates have been rising. We've showed you different yield curves in the past. And so on this particular slide, we're showing um, the 10-year um, versus the two-year, and then also the 10-year relative to the three-month. Now, a lot of people watch the 10-year, two-year, and that has been actually solidly inverted, meaning that short-term rates are higher than long-term rates since the um, uh, summer, starting in July. They were actually briefly um, inverted in early April uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And, and on this slide, we're, we're showing that the 10-year relative to the three-month is not inverted. And the reason people watch that is that is actually what the Fed looks at. But interestingly, in the last couple of days, um, that uh, yield curve has also slightly inverted. And so again, um, the reason people watch this is in the past, um, you typically see the start of recessions within six to nine months after these in inversions. And let's touch on inflation because uh, we mentioned inflation a couple of times here. What are we seeing with inflation and what do we expect? Yeah, so looking at the uh, line at the top, uh, going kind of straight up, that is looking at US CPI. And so that's currently around 8.3%. It did actually peak around 9.2%. So that looks like it may, might be starting to come down. Now, in the middle, the, the uh, purple um, line is consumer expectations as measured by the University of Michigan. And so that's come down a little bit, but consumers really over the next year are expecting inflation to be about 5%. And then the bottom, we're looking at really two indicators. One is the, uh, uh, the Fed, the Cleveland Fed, you know, their expectation is that in a year inflation will be down to 2.4%. And then when you look at the gray line, 
uh, that's at 2%, uh, roughly 2%, 2.2%. That's looking at the bond forward uh, markets. And so again, both of those are lower and kind of remaining more anchored. And that's important because if inflation expectations get out of control, uh, that means that inflation will be more sticky. Yes. And a big driver of inflation um, has been transportation. We're gonna see that in a second, but the reason that we're seeing some of these numbers come down um, and maybe expectations still anchored relatively low is that we are seeing big components of what was driving inflation start to improve. Yeah, no, absolutely. So if we look at the yellow on the bar charts, that's transportation. So obviously during the pandemic, um, it actually was deflationary. Uh, but then in the start of the recovery uh, in the spring of 2021, um, we did start to see uh, transportation costs go up. And that's important because obviously a lot of goods are moved and have transportation costs embedded, but also uh, food has transportation costs as well. And then on top of that, you, you have that transportation cost, but then you have the energy cost mm. on top of that. Now we know energy prices have come down, but interestingly, transportation prices are starting to come down and have been really for the last six mm -hmm. months. And, and we'll see that partially here with the World Container Index. Yeah, and, and so that is kind of one of the things um, that people monitor uh, from a transportation standpoint. And they really peaked in the late fourth quarter of last year and have been coming down. Um, and here on the far left, you're looking at what that container cost would be. Uh, it kind of peaked at, you know, 16,000. Uh, and now is kind of under 8,000. Um, so a pretty big uh, difference, uh, but that should start filtering into the CPI numbers. So there's a little glimmer there of, of some good news. As far as our outlook regarding the markets, so you know we already mentioned from an economic perspective, outlook is still looking challenged. From an equity market perspective, we do think volatility will continue to remain in the system, uh, particularly around any Fed announcement. I mean, it seems like anything that happens with the Fed, market reacts to. I, I just, as I was coming in for today's session, uh, saw that there was an article in, in the Wall Street, I think just Wall Street Journal Online that was just issued, talking about maybe a couple of the Fed members suggesting that they might not be as aggressive. And now I see the stock market's up two or 300 points, or at least it was you know, 20 minutes ago. Um, so I think the market's gonna remain very volatile, especially around anything to do with the Fed. Uh, remember the next Fed meeting is November 1st and 2nd, which means on the 2nd, Jerome Powell will have his press conference announcing what they're going to do and it's i think fully expected at this point they're going to raise short-term rates another 75 basis points um, but you know those days are probably going to have just a lot of volatility and then in december i think it's december 13th and 14th is the last meeting of the year um, which again they're expected to raise short-term rates uh, once again so just expect that that volatility earnings growth as we mentioned definitely a swing factor Valuations are looking better, particularly in value-oriented positions and international positions. Although, um, you know, we have said the last year or two, international looks good from a valuation perspective, uh, but they still continue to to struggle a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who could have predicted that Russia would invade Ukraine? That good would point. roil the energy markets, the uh, agricultural markets kind of put Europe in a really tough situation. And, and quite frankly, um, that's not even over. For that's them true at this point. And the strong dollar. I mean, absolutely. You said 20 year highs, and that's true on most currencies. But I think for the, the yen, it's actually maybe closer to 40 year highs. It's, it's really amazing. Uh, but here's another glimmer of, of sunlight. And that is markets are forward looking. So even, and we talked about this last webinar, Jonathan, even if the economy hasn't yet started to recover, 
the markets typically recover in advance. So we always have to keep that in mind. And with that, as we mentioned, valuations are looking more attractive. Right, now valuation isn't really a timing tool, but really what we're saying is that valuations are really no longer the problem. So here we're looking at the S&P, uh, it's trading at about 15 times forward expectations, which is now below the 25 year average. If we look at small caps and mid caps, they look actually maybe even a little bit more attractive. And as we mentioned, from a valuation perspective, um, international and emerging markets are actually even cheaper uh, than the US markets um, against that relationship, but even against their own history. Well, and with regards to the markets being forward looking, uh, another important note to make is that consumers sentiment is not a very good predictor of forward performance, or at least a, not a very good positive correlation, maybe negative correlation, but not positive. So here, what we're seeing is um, the blue dots that are at the bottom of this chart, those are periods in which consumer sentiment has been at a low point. So you can see from the circle that just appeared, October of 1990 was a low point. But then the next 12 months, the S&P was up 29%. And on average, if you look, there's eight peaks in consumer sentiment. Those eight peaks on average produced 4% return over the next 12 months. Whereas there's eight troughs on this chart the forward 12 month performance after those troughs was almost 25%. So it's almost, as I mentioned, an inverse relationship. So when things feel bad and people feel bad and they're expressing that sentiment, I wouldn't get too anchored in that with forward expectations of market returns. As a matter of fact, I might use it as a contrarian, as a contrarian indicator. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The other contrarian indicator is uh, inflation, and markets tend to perform well following peak inflation. Yeah. So here we're looking at different inflationary periods, and if we look at the bottom, uh, the average stock bounce is 21%. The average bounce uh, within bonds is 7%. Now, we do have one instance, July of 2008, where stocks did not go up, um, but uh, bonds did have, have a nice increase. But the reason everyone's looking at inflation and what's happening to it is that um, the market very well may go up once people are convinced that it's coming down. Well, last, uh, last quarter we talked about market bottoms and the economy and how markets tend to be forward looking um, with, with unemployment so low right now and the expectation that unemployment will go up. I mean, not to, you know, I, I don't think this is anything good to say, but, you know, frankly, I think the Federal Reserve wants unemployment to go up a little bit. Uh, that's gonna help cool inflation. Uh, but I think what we're trying to show here is that, the markets can continue to go up or can, I guess, begin to go up, but the news on unemployment still be somewhat negative. Yeah, absolutely. So we have nine instances here, and in seven of them, um, you see the purple line and the green line going up, and that's essentially the market recovering while unemployment is going up. And so everyone is thinking, well, if the labor markets are getting worse, that must mean the market's gonna get worse. Uh, but not necessarily so when you look back at history. Good point, good point. So we talked about our outlook on the equity markets. Um, how about the bond markets? Because we did beat up on bonds uh, quite a bit here. It's, it's just been a tough year in, in the bond market. Um, Again, acknowledging they're down a lot less than stocks though, but 
if a recession occurs, I would be very careful of having too much credit risk. Yeah, absolutely. We've kind of talked a little bit about high yield bonds. Um, if we go into a recession, then obviously the fear of uh, defaults and delinquencies goes up. And as a result, we might see those high yield spreads blow out to higher levels, which would mean that prices would go down. So you'd have negative performance. Or even more, more negative, negative performance. Yes. Yeah. Now we do actually, to that point, we expect future total returns to improve generally, maybe outside of high yield if we did have credits blow out. But uh, our general thought is future total returns are expected to re improve. And of course, yields have become much more attractive. And we'll see on this slide that returns do tend to follow yields. So the blue line being the nominal five-year treasury yield and the uh, orange line being the five-year returns. And as yields go up, those forward five-year returns coincide. And of course, as yields go down, the forward five-year expected return uh, also comes down. So with yields this year coming up, you know, into that 4% level that, that we're currently seeing, we would expect uh, returns to start following uh, those yields because we're starting again uh, going forward at, at higher yield, you're collecting that yield. And with higher yields actually comes a little bit more protection from further rate increases. So what we're showing here is if you started with a 10-year 0% bond and rates went up 50 basis points, you would see essentially a 5% hit on that bond. If you start at a 4% yield and rates went up that same 50 basis points, it would actually not really impact the bond that much at all. And just the opposite, if actually rates went down, you'd see a nice little bump in the bond. Okay, so I know, you know, people are, are kind of negative right now on bonds, but I, I would be careful to anchor in today's performance and expect that that is going to be what we see going forward, because that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, and in fact, you know, if um, rates, meaning the 10-year treasury, were to go up a little bit from here, you know, looking at this chart, we wouldn't actually expect uh, returns to be negative from, from this point. Right. So let's take a look at different bond yields. Um, so the purple line is basically showing the median 10-year return for each of these types of bonds, the U.S. Treasuries being at the very far left, leveraged loans being at the far right, and then various types uh, in between. The diamond is showing the current yield. Um, and, and I think you wanted to speak uh, to the point of the high yield versus say more yeah. of the investment grade. Yep, absolutely. So if we look on the left side, uh, third over, that's the investment grade corporate bonds. You'll see that the yield is at 5.7%, which is actually at the top end of its range over the last 10 years. On the other side of, of the coin though, let's look at US high yield, which is the second from the right. Um, its yield is at 9.7%, which yes, is higher than the investment grade corporates, but is still below its high end range. And so again, if we slip into a recession and people become more uh, afraid of uh, delinquencies and bankruptcies, we could see the, the yield on high yields blow out to a higher level. Um, and, and so further underperformance than from high yield. So again, it, we're not in a situation where you wanna stretch uh, for yield and take on more credit risk. Good point. All right, so um, with that, we're gonna transition now into our Silver Oak updates and other important items, as well as talking briefly about our insurance series and travel insurance. We can get through this, I think, relatively quickly. Um, we have one really exciting 
news uh, to report, and that is the 2021 tax season is over. Um, now, I know a lot of people think that tax season ends uh, April 15th, but that's uh, just not the case. It actually ends October 15th, or this year it was actually October 17th, since the 15th fell on a on a Saturday. Um, so thank you for uh, everyone that got your information in in advance of October 1st. Um, we had a couple of stragglers, but uh, we try and get as many done as quickly as possible. And thank you to to all of our team members that are involved in tax season and uh, making it an, an, another successful year in getting the returns completed timely. As far as IQs, our investment quality scoring system, give us a brief performance update there, Jonathan. Well, that's absolutely. So returns across the board are negative, um, not surprising. On a relative basis though, our value funds I think are doing better than our growth funds. Our international funds are actually doing pretty well. We've been spending time uh, talking to our managers, um, understanding their positioning, but relative to a recovery and how they would do. Mm -hmm. And so we feel confident about that. As far as personnel updates, I'm very happy to announce we have two new team members, uh, a new associate pair planner. Uh, so Jeb, welcome to the team. It's great having you on board. Uh, and also a new tax manager, uh, Kyle, just uh, within the last week or so has joined us. So welcome Kyle as well. We look forward to having these new resources uh, to help service our clients. And uh, as we continue to grow, we'll continue to add resources. Year-end reminders, and oh my goodness, Jonathan, I can't believe we're even talking about year-end reminders. Um, time just flies, but as you're thinking of, of um, taxes, maybe you just got your 2021 returns filed, uh, never too soon to think about 2022 and keeping good tax records so that uh, when February comes around and everybody starts you know, getting their 1099s, you can just slip them in your file and send them over to your tax preparer so that they can get started. Um, if you haven't done a tax projection, highly recommend doing a year in tax projection. I uh, just, you know, one thing we try and avoid is any surprises, and uh, we definitely don't like tax surprises. Uh, if if we do your tax projection, you've probably already seen it. Uh, frankly, we've probably done it two or three times throughout the year. Um, but if you don't have a tax projection yet, I'd encourage you to get one. Watch for year-end capital gain distributions. Now, this is gonna be less of an issue in 2022 as it was in 2021. Uh, last year, abnormally high capital gain distributions because we came off with three consecutive years of the equity markets being up 20 plus percent. Um, I think 22, Jonathan, probably gonna be abnormally low. That's year. what we're seeing so far. We haven't gotten every um, uh, fund uh, in yet, but uh, that's the trend we're seeing. Consider tax loss harvesting. You know, I, I tell folks there's only two things good that come from down markets like this. One, you have to have these markets in order for our capital markets to continue to function. If there was no risk uh, or consequence of the risk, everybody just pile on and pile on and pile on. So this is part of the capital markets functioning properly. Um, that's not much you know, benefit though to me uh, personally. So uh, what's the other benefit? Get some tax benefits along the way, right? We believe in buy and hold and we believe, believe in long-term strategies, but we also believe in taking tax benefits when we can get them. And that's what tax loss harvesting does. Process year-end charitable donations, um, either utilizing low basis stock, if you still have some low basis stock at a gain, uh, and there are many portfolios that still do, or using your IRA required minimum distribution. The only thing I would say here is be sure to get these started in November. 
Um, I think our operations team would be particularly happy with that. So we're not trying to rush on December 20th to process these things and crossing our fingers that, that they get uh, done by the, the 31st. The IRS just issued some new limits. Um, so gifting limits next year will be going up from 16,000 in 2022 to 17,000. The federal estate tax exemption is going up. And those that are collecting social security, you're gonna get a pay raise of 8.7%. So congratulations to you. HSA contributions have gone up. But we don't yet know about some of these other limits. Uh, we would uh, expect the 401k contribution limits and IRA contributions may be going up, but the IRS hadn't yet issued this data. Uh, and so we don't have the information quite yet. So Jonathan, with that, let's talk about our first session in the insurance series and that's on travel insurance. And I know we wanted to touch on this because uh, post COVID people are traveling now. Um, and a lot of them are going overseas. And with the holidays coming up, I suspect that's gonna be maybe even a bigger issue. Uh, so what does travel insurance cover? Well, it co uh, covers uh, cancellation, interruption and delay. You can get riders of cancel for any reason, um, which means that essentially we'll cover other things that don't typically get covered. Like maybe COVID too. Correct. COVID's not always covered. Abs absolutely. Uh, baggage and personal belongings, 24 hour assistance, um, travel medical, which can be very, very important. Um, emergency evacuation, um, accidental death and dismemberment. Yeah, and, and when I look at this, I'm, honestly, I think travel, medical, and the emergency evacuation, I mean, those are the ones, if I were gonna buy this, that's why I would buy it. Um, those are the things that, that frankly, even if you could afford them financially on your own without the insurance, there is the added benefit that you've got an insurance company, that this is what they do. And they have the resources around the world to activate if you had an emergency and needed to be evacuated. So if for no other reason, those are the ones I think worth considering this coverage uh, for. Now the premiums can vary depending on the length and the cost of the trip, where you're going, uh, where you're coming from, your state of residence, your age, what medical conditions you want covered, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there's really two interesting types and, and one I find quite interesting. There's the single trip where you, okay, I'm going uh, with the family to you know, Paris or to wherever. Uh, and, and I want the coverage for that single occasion. Or there's the long-term travel coverage, which essentially buy a policy a year at a time. So you have coverage for the entire year. You can go typically anywhere in the world and you can go typically as many times as you want. Uh, I just had some, some clients express some interest in this and we got a quote from Chubb uh, in this case. And, and this coverage, this long-term travel, it was an annual policy. It was $300 for the individual or if you wanted to cover multiple people in the family, it was $600. Now that's an average, it was, you know, for this particular case, it could vary depending on your circumstances. But Jonathan, I just thought that was like a really, in my opinion, reasonable premium for, especially for somebody that's doing a lot of overseas travel. Um, I, I just was kind of astonished. I was expecting it to be, you know, a thousand or $2,000. Now, where can you secure this coverage? I made reference here to Chubb. Um, there's others, AXA and Berkshire and AIG, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and actually some credit cards might cover basic components of this. Um, 
So you'd certainly want to make sure you reach out to your credit card company and understand what they do and don't cover before you rely solely on that. Um, but if you're looking for a policy, uh, you can definitely reach out to one of your Silver Oak advisors. As you know, we don't sell insurance. Um, we don't sell any kind of insurance, but we have the resources that we can tap into to help assist you. Or you can reach out to these companies directly. So with that, we're coming to the conclusion of today's session. Uh, if you have any questions, I encourage you to reach out to your Silver Oak advisor. Um, if you have topics for future sessions, I encourage you to share those topics and we'll do some research and hopefully be able to um, address those in one of our future sessions. If you're not working with the Silver Oak advisor and you wanna reach out to one of our team members, uh, you can feel free to start with me. Just call me at 952-896-5701. And with that, thank you, Jonathan, for your time. And thank you, everyone, for participating. We hope you have a great day.